try to use it for dinner. I'm so full that we ate. If I fall asleep, just nudge. <laughs> two hour talk tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Settle it. Um, let's see, how did I get involved? So what I'm, what I'm going to talk about tonight is going to learn a little bit of international law. In fact, the original international law. I mean, what is international law? It's the principles that govern the conduct of nations vis-a-vis -vis other nations. So how did the European nations decide to divide the entire world for their own benefit? So that's a little bit what I'm talking about tonight. And that's what we, today we call it the doctrine of discovery. In Thomas Jefferson's time, and our founding fathers, and when they put it in our Constitution, and when they put it in the first law they had acted about in the Enterprise, July 22, 1790, they called it preemption. And we'll talk about what that means today. So we're also going to learn a little bit about American Indian law, federal Indian law. That's what I've practiced as a lawyer since 1991, and as a professor since 1999, and taught this subject. And then we're going to tie all that into how Oregon, and more than just the state, but we're talking about the Oregon country writ large, how did the Oregon country become part of the United States? So it was a little bit of international law, it was a little bit of Indian law, it was a little bit of gunboat diplomacy, etc. So we're going to talk about all those subjects and try to do that in an hour. And if you have a question while I'm talking, feel free to throw up your hand if you want. Uh, my, my PowerPoint is sort of my outline. I won't lose track. Don't worry about that. And if I leave you with no questions and you're all asleep at the end, well, I won't allow that to happen. You know, you learn in school, you make noise, you walk around the room. So he was hoping I was going to use the microphone to stand up. I cannot possibly do that. I'm going to be moving around. So we had moved ahead to this map. And so what I want to tell you is that literally the doctrine of discovery, this international law that I'm going to very briefly explain to you, that started in the 1430s, the 1450s, it commenced when Spain and Portugal began sailing outside the side of land and they started finding those island groups that are off the Iberian Peninsula and off the west coast of Africa, the Cape Verde Islands, uh, the Canary Islands, etc. And they wanted to own it. Look at that, I jumped way ahead already. <laughs> 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 lost 10 minutes on it. Okay. But that international law principle explains the growth of every piece of the United States. How we got the land territory we have today, Alaska and Hawaii, were based on these claims under international law that the U.S. was deemed by other countries to own particular territory. Forgive that indigenous people were living just as the Coquilles and all these other tribes were living for thousands of years. The mere fact that Europeans and later Americans showed up on the shore with their cross and their flag, they were claiming the land and they were using international law to do that. And I'm sure you've seen the pictures of Columbus and all those other explorers. What the, you know, and what is the, I see many of you paint, and the caption is always, the explorer was thanking God for a safe voyage across the ocean. Well, yes, I'm sure they were. Columbus didn't fall off the edge. So, you know, my folks were taught that in school. Did Columbus think he was going to fall off the edge? Well, of course not. Why would we taught that stuff? There's a legal term for that BS. Why would we taught that BS in school? Because he knew he was headed to, the, to India and the Chinas and the Japans, they called it. The contracts he signed with Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain when he set forth in 1492, was to find new lands for them. Maybe you guys don't know, there's another little story we're taught in school, that he was only going to get a good price on pepper and cinnamon, right? <laughs> he signed seven documents with the king and queen. Only in the seventh document are spices mentioned. And yes, that he was headed, hopefully, in the direction of China and Japan. But I'll tell you what, it was in there, and I can quote you this, they said, quote, we will make you the admiral over any land you acquire from us, period, close quote. So he was looking for new land to do this and, and to claim it. So if you know Columbus, his history literally made four voyages to the new world, right? The moment he landed on what, San Salvador and Hispanola, right? He turned around and headed right back to Spain so that the Spain could now make claims to own these lands he had discovered. But don't forget there were native people living on all those islands. He captured some of them, 
kidnapped him and took him back. Oh yeah, I jumped way ahead. But this sticking, what do you mean on the moon? <laughs> Who owns those moon rocks we brought? What if there had been oil on the moon? Do you guys know what Russia and China have been doing in the past decade? Do you know what happened on August the 2nd, 2007? I was giving this speech at the Lummi Reservation, top of north of Washington. Someone in the front row goes, after a talk about this, they said, well, did you see what Russia did today? What? I was preparing for this talk. They planted their flag at the bottom of the North Pole. Did you guys know that? You can go online and see a photo of the sub that's two miles below the surface. <laughs> this is mechanical or <laughs> And a Russian flag, well, what's that about? One quarter of the Earth's known resources of oil and gas are under the North Pole. And Russia is claiming that. And in fact, for a while, there was talk that NATO said we will defend that. This could become a hot war to fight over who has the ownership of that. Well, do you guys know what's going on in the South China Sea? China, Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, they're all fighting over sovereignty over that, that body of water, who can control shipping. You already are ahead of me, aren't you? What did China put on the bottom of the South China Sea in August 2010? It's flat. What is China doing about that? They're building those islands, they're building buildings, they're putting troops in those buildings. They're doing what the United States did at Fort Clatsop in 1805. And what Thomas Jefferson ordered Meriwether Lewis to do. They're doing what the English tried to do with John McLaughlin at Fort Vancouver. Now, if you know McLaughlin and the Hudson Bay Trading Company, he was the factor, the, the boss of the factory, they called him, trading post back then. Notice he built on the north side of the Columbia River. Well, not, I don't know, 1825, I think, is when he built Fort, uh, Fort Vancouver. The English had long thought that the Columbia River would be the war. So they had him plant his factory on the north side of the Columbia. Now, jumping ahead, you're not seeing the significance of some of the things that I'm saying we're talking about. But this is what I'm going to explain to you. We're going to tie it to the Indian law. And when we get done, the one thing you're going to remember is that everything, so I already told you, Columbus didn't think he was going to sail over the edge. Columbus wasn't only going for pepper and cinnamon. And you're also going to find out what every historian says incorrectly about the Louisiana Territory and the Louisiana Purchase. They always say that we doubled the size of the U.S and that it was the greatest real estate deal in history. The U.S. paid only $15 million for 800 million acres of land. Three cents an acre. Well, I'm going to show you that that is not all we paid for the Louisiana Territory, and that even Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers knew that we had not bought the land. And you guys already know this in the back of your mind. You know that there are over 100 tribes in this area still to this day who signed over 100 treaties with the in which the tribe now agreed to give up some land for various payments, for a doctor, for a teacher, for annuities, they're called, annual payments of perhaps trade goods or literal cash. My home tribe, well, my tribe was in Ohio, and we were removed to Oklahoma in a, I guess I can't find Oklahoma. It doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> you know, well, here's a side point. Of course, all the tribes who moved to Oklahoma were promised in the treaties they would never be under the control of a state again. So I agree, we do not have Oklahoma. There's no such thing. <laughs> okay, where are we? Keep going. Let's go. So let's go here. Here's the Indian law part of the talk. This is the first United States Supreme Court case about Indian law issues. And what rights tribes owned in their lands, and what rights Europeans acquired when they just showed up and stuck their flag and cross in the soil. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote this opinion. You probably know his name. He's our most famous. How many of you know who the current Chief Justice is? Okay, this isn't a law class, but I bet you do know John Marshall. He wrote three Indian law cases, and they form the basis. They're called the Marshall Trilogy. They form the basis of federal Indian law today. The United States relation with power over, if you want to call it that, the Indian nation. And this case, I can tell you the fact very quickly, especially since we're on this clock, and Amy's back there already looking at me. No, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> she's a little messy here. Mr. Johnson's grandfather had 
had been part of a company that had gone through the woods of what's now Illinois and Indiana, allegedly buying land from every Indian they could find. So the Indian would put his thumbprint on a piece of paper, and Johnson's grandfather's company would pay them. They claimed to own these lands. Mr. McIntosh, however, was living on allegedly the same piece of land, and he had acquired his title to this piece of land in what's now Illinois from the United States, who had bought the land allegedly from the tribe, the Piankishaw tribe, and also the Illinois tribe, you know, the state of Illinois named after a tribe, in 1830. And Mr. McIntosh bought it in 1818 from the United States. So McIntosh is living on this land and farming it. Grandson Johnson inherits the shares from his grandfather and now brings this lawsuit to throw McIntosh off the land. You are trespassing, Johnson said, on land. My grandfather and his company bought from these Indians right in the woods back in the uh, before English time. Oh, I want you to remember this because the purchases that his grandfather had been involved in were in 1773 and in 1775, before the existence of the United States. So it took 50 years for this case to follow up through lower courts, through political processes, through bribes, pure and simple things. Benjamin Franklin was bribed to advocate for this Johnson case. A lot of our early founding fathers were paid to advocate with the King of England that Johnson's company should own all these lands. They tried to get Congress to ratify it. They tried to get the legislature of Virginia to ratify it. Forget it, you can't buy any land. And so the case finally goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. And this is the case that I and everyone else that teaches this subject who start with Johnson v. McIntosh. And Johnson v. McIntosh is still the law today. It regulates how a Coquille tribe owns the lands they do here. It controls how my tribe owns the land it does. Or the Navajo Nation, the largest reservation in the United States, is controlled by what Johnson and McIntosh finally hold. So what did John Marshall write? And the court unanimously held that this country was settled under discovery and conquest. So this phrase, see I'm getting hard. It's getting hard. <laughs> This, the phrase, the doctrine of discovery, comes literally from this case, and it's used multiple, multiple times of discovery and what rights under international law and Europeans acquired when they showed up. Now, I usually pick someone in the front of the audience here, and I go, well, I'm coming over to your house tonight with the Bob Miller flag and the Bob Miller religious symbol, and I'm going to claim it. Now, what's she going to do? 911? Or if we were in Arizona, she'd shoot me dead. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. You know, I found out, according to some poll, Oregonians have more guns than the people in Arizona do. <laughs> my home state. See, I still live in both states pretty much. But anyway, I figure my students have guns, so I never try to be mean. <laughs> That's our job to be mean. Anyway, sorry. So if I came to you guys, we would not, because it's got to be insane. Why would a he think he has some rights to her house just because I show up? I go, well, my religion's better than yours. <laughs> now, if I make a joke about gender, which no, I never will. <laughs> well, I'm a man, you're a woman. Or I'm from Arizona now, you're just an Oregonian. You know? So, look, huh? But now if the courts and the army help me take your house, now you got Indian law. Okay, so this country was settled on discovery. And John Marshall's about a 30 page opinion. He recounts a little bit of what I said already. How the Spanish and the Portuguese started sailing outside of Lyon. They found the Canary Islands, etc. They turned to the Pope folks to tell them who owned these lands. Now don't, you know, the Pope's still pretty important today, right? But the Pope was pretty darn important in the 1430s when they could excommunicate you and you couldn't even continue. So I'm going to show you a map in this moment. Let's finish this. So what did this mean that the uh, Europeans had shown up and what's this word conquest? Because none of these tribes had fought a war with the English or with the United States. They hadn't fought a war and lost a war. But Marshall says that the mere fact when the Europeans 
showed up. It was the same as if they had conquered the natives in a war when there hadn't even been one yet. So it's fiction in a sense. But if one side had the out of law and the other side had bows and arrows, we know how that law question is going to turn out. So what did they do to tribes? Well, they lost some of their real property rights. Now that's just for us in the law, that just means land. You know, real estate, a real estate agent sells real property, land. So the, the court said the tribes now had a limited property right. And the tribes went, well, how? When? Did you pay us? Did we consent? No. And you guys notice, I don't see any Indian names in this case. <laughs> Doesn't look like any Fulfill names or Shawnee names that I know of. And what else did tribes do? Oh, they lost some of their sovereign powers, their governmental authority. Now they could only deal and trade with and engage in diplomacy and sign treaties with that European country that showed up to cross the water. Now I want to repeat to you that this case was deciding what international law and Indian law was under English colonial rule. Because that's when Johnson's grandfather, the company, made these purchases that were in question. And I think you already know who won, don't you? Macintosh won. Because he got his title from the United States, who had inherited its power over these tribes from England in the treaty that ended our Revolutionary War and the treaty that ended the War of 1812. So, and in fact, what some of those treaties say is that England landed all its proprietary rights. What does proprietor mean? The ownership rights. England granted all its proprietary rights south of Canada to the United States. So it was that magic moment that England's discovery rights, power over the indigenous peoples, now passed to the United States. So it was a property right that could be sold the way as, you know, if I like your house that much, I could buy it from you, couldn't I? Or I could come with my wife. I wonder what a Bob Miller religious symbol is. I'm going to have to work on that. Okay, now well, I think I'm going to jump ahead too, but let's, well, let's look at this. This map. If, if any of you have studied world history, you will hear the phrase, the line of demarcation. And when I was first really researching this, is the first I've heard of it. Let me tell you, I should start with that. How did I, a law professor, get into this? <laughs> well, the chief, my tribe got involved in the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, because Lewis and Clark passed through some of our land. And in 2003, my chief called me, and he says, Bob, we've been asked to appoint a representative to this Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Commission. Then you want to do that? Well, I didn't have tenure then, and I'm a law professor, not a history prof. So I told him, no, I can't, I, I can't do that. I have to think about how to get tenure, or which I research and write about. So a couple of days later, I thought, my God, I will not be here for the 300-year anniversary of Lewis and Clark. <laughs> I had better participate. So I called him back, and, and I'll tell you, you know why I decided to? Because I started thinking about this case. I thought, I wonder if Thomas Jefferson knew this doctrine of discovery. Now notice the date. This is 20 years after Mary Weather Lewis left on the Lewis and Clark expedition. But obviously I knew this was old law from 1450s. And if you didn't know this, Jefferson was a lawyer. He practiced law the whole time from 1767 to 1774 before he really entered Virginia politics full time. So I just thought, I wonder what they knew about it. I wonder if Lewis and Clark themselves knew what they were doing when they crossed the country with the flag. And did you guys know they carried a branding map with them? If, I jumped ahead of myself, but if you want to see it, it's at the Oregon Historical Society. It's one of the few items we know without any question that they carried across the continent. What were they doing carrying a branding iron? And it says U period, S period, C A P T period, M period, Lewis. Well, he was a captain in the army. Remember, this was a military expedition sent by the United States, paid for by the United States, because as I'm going to tell you, it was to acquire land and rights for the United States and to try to grasp the American country where we are right now. Okay, well, I'm back to this. So, Portugal and Spain started saying outside. Well, they literally found the Canary Island back in 1341. But it took about 100 years for their dispute to become dangerous enough that maybe war was going to happen. 
So they turned to the Pope. King Duarte II of Portugal asked the Pope, Eugenius II, to the Pope. Well, they're human. I can't give them to you. Now, I want you to put yourself, you be the Pope for a moment. <laughs> Let me ask you, Pope. If you will grant me the Canary Islands, I will turn them all into Catholics. Uh, what do you think? The Pope gave <laughs> Portugal the Canary Islands in 1436 by a papal bull. You know what a papal bull is? These are the edicts, the official orders of the church. I'm not sure they use that phrase anymore, but there were thousands of papal bulls. So 1436, Duarte controlled the Canary Islands, and you know why? Convert them, civilize them, and Christianize. You know, so because, of course, they had to be wild savages if they weren't Europeans. And he popped there. So, anyway, so then in 1452, 53, and 55, the new Pope, Pope Nicholas V, he grants Portugal more papal gold as Portugal is sailing down the west coast of Africa. And everywhere Portugal is going, the people go ashore, they do that, and they erect these stone pedroas there in the shape of a cross. And it said this land belongs to the king of Portugal. Now they wanted the Pope to ratify those claims too. And Pope Nicholas V did issuing papal bulls in those years, I said, granting Spain not only the requirement to convert and civilize, but now to acquire sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title to the land. So the Pope and the church literally thought Pope had the power to grant title to the land right out from under indigenous peoples. Obviously, there were thousands, if not millions, of Africans living in the area. So Spain was being cut out of all this, if you notice. Who got all those papal bulls? Portugal. So when Columbus shows up at the port of Isabel and Ferdinand and says, I think I can find land going that way, they were very interested. So they send him forth under those contracts, I already mentioned to you. And when he finds, you know, lands in the booth, when he lands in the Caribbean, he races back and they send their attorneys, who are the only good guys in this story, <laughs> the lawyers, send their attorneys to the Pope and says, now grant us some papal bulls out here. And so the Pope Alexander VI does so. In 1493, he issues four papal bulls. The first two are called Intercatera Divinia I and two. Don't speak Latin, don't know what you trust me. But granted now to, Port to Spain the rights to the obligation to convert, civilize, Christianize, but the rights of sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title. And that's what, and it said any lands that you have discovered, or any lands you will discover, so long as no other Christian has yet been there. So this was emerging international law. So what I want to so we're learning a little international law. This was really the first international law. How were these governments of Europe, how were their explorations and their claimants and their conquests to be governed? Hopefully you go avoid war, right? You know, if you and I agree to divide your house up, we don't need to fight. Maybe the two of us together are so powerful, we'll just take her house and you can have the two floors and all that at the bottom there. I said, perfectly logical. Isn't this what Europeans were doing? How will we? By the whole rest of the world. And that is real. Folks, I was in Australia. I was supposed to always, that was my other caveat. If I say something stupid tonight, blame it on the fact that I have not yet been back 48 hours. <laughs> so I'm still on hobby time. My wife and I got her today and we thought that was the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that the Eastern Pacific or whatever you call it. Because we were just in Sydney and Brisbane. We were on the Pacific. Okay. So Pope Alex, and folks, the other folks was the fact that the earth was flat. The Pope draws this dotted line in that second papal bowl I just cited you. From the North Pole to the South Pole. How do you know about the poles? If the Earth was flat, so that's a, you know, more BS. But, so this is the line of demarcation that the Pope drew right there, 1493 in Intercatera. Now, Portugal refused to obey that line for two reasons. They had already assumed there was more land out here. And if you guys remember, Portugal was attempting to round Africa. And each year was sending ships further and further south. And you needed to sail way out here to catch the trade winds, to rip 
to whip around the body. Remember, Vasco da Gama finally rounds Africa in 1498. So in 1493, Portugal says, no, 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 we don't agree with this. Wow, so much of the risk of being excommunicated. I get money is more powerful. Okay. But anyway, so Spain and Portugal signed a treaty in the Spanish city of Torre in 1494. They moved that line about 500 miles to the west. What language do they speak in Brazil? Portuguese. What language do they speak in the rest of the New World? Spanish. Accident? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to buy my book. <laughs> Remember, all the prophets go here. I didn't even know they were gay. She said they arrived today, so did you know the word hot off the press? <laughs> so, of course, now Spain and Portugal did fight about, about some of the land down here, and you can see Brazil is much larger today than where that line is, isn't it? So, okay, we don't have time to get into that. But look at that. When Magellan then rounds South America, in 1521, well, now you've got to decide where this line is through the Pacific. Now, Balboa had already crossed modern-day Panama, and when he got to the Pacific side, he did that same charade I was talking about at your house. Boom, boom. And the Spanish would strut along the beach. They'd have their sword out, cutting crosses in the sand and cutting crosses in the vegetation. And Balboa writes, No one, I claim this land for Spain, he waded out into the water and came this little ocean, the one I just flew across for 14 hours. I claimed this ocean for Spain, and no one objected. There was no one there. The priests were always along, and they're singing the Te Deum. I don't even know what the Te Deum is, but it's some sacred song. So they were claiming this under the power of God. So now that the Jella crosses down here, you got to decide where this line of 1493, as altered by the Treaty of Torres, where is that line? Yeah. Folks, if you guys know world history at all, you'll know that the Portuguese mostly controlled this area. Goa, a city in India, is still very Portuguese influenced, but then the Dutch conquered the Portuguese. So it's the Dutch who then colonized much of Indonesia. And you know that the Dutch landed a couple times on the west coast of Africa, uh, Australia. Where was I <laughs> 1606 and 1616, Dutch explorers went ashore and hung up metal plates that said this land belongs to the colonists. And you know that when James Cook landed here in 1770, he really only claimed the eastern part of Australia because he knew also where this line was. If I had to, well, we should talk about Cook a little bit because you guys know he landed three times in modern day Alaska. Most people are unaware of that. On his third round of world trip, until the indigenous Hawaiians ended his expedition, paid by the most, yeah. And they ate him, if you don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, so he lands three times in Alaska. Of course, you know what Cook's Inlet is, right? That runs right up to Anchorage. And there's a place there called Possession. And it's where he sent his men ashore to do, you know, a home, a home, raise the English flag. They said, we drank a good British porter to the help of the king, and I claimed all this land for you. And they landed two other places up there. George Vancouver sailed at the port into Puget Sound, May of 1792, did the same thing, shooting cannons off from the ship, going ashore. So we were doing the same thing Bob Boa had done in 1530. Doing the same thing Columbus did in 1492. So doing the same thing Russia did in 2000. So Cook ended up in Alaska. How come the Russians ended up colonizing? You gotta read my other chapter. <laughs> it's online. I should give you guys, I have 55 papers online that you can get for free. I should have that thing up here. That's a long a side story, but oh, well, here, thank you. He opened this up for me. <clears throat> Let's jump ahead to this, because I got this one slide out of order. So what did the doctrine of discovery, what does John P. McIntosh define a discovery as, whatever awkward sentence? Um, in the law, folks, we break law crimes and we break torts down into the basic elements. So right now, the government's trying to, is prosecuting man for trying to prove certain crimes. There are certain elements that they have to prove that make up that crime to convict him, and they must prove all four of them. 
If you and I get in a car wreck out here and I try to sue you in order to get court for negligence, there are four elements of the tort of negligence I must prove to the man. So as a lawyer, I read Johnson and McIntosh about 30 times, and I thought, well, what, what are the elements of the doctrine of this God? So these 10 things, what I have defined, uh, are as constitute the doctrine. So what you just asked me, why did Russia gain Alaska over us or over England? Now, see, Russia would claim they were there long before Cook was, and I'm pretty sure they were. I think in about 1740 is the first time that a Russian found like the Aleutian Islands. So who was first? We're going to talk about that in the Oregon territory in a moment, but I just want to cover these pretty quickly. So first, you know, discover first, of course, be the first European Christian country that landed somewhere. Of course, how do you prove that? They didn't have GPS back then, did they? You know what, boy, James Book pretty smart guy. He put British coins in glass jars and buried it where he went. Now his men that he sent ashore on possession point in Cook's Inlet, they said some natives were watching us. So we waited until they went around the rock before we buried the coin. I wonder if the natives would come back and go, ooh, look at this disturbed earth. I'm going to put them in. What do you think those bozos left? Okay. And they didn't leave us any quarter. Okay. Now, here's your question. Here's what developed after the idea that the Pope said, you find it first, it's yours. England began to develop, and Elizabeth I developed this second element of the discovery doctrine. You have to not only find it first, but you must get back within a reasonable length of time and occupy the place. Now, I'm going to tell you in a moment, that's what Lewis and Clark were doing. And that's what Thomas Jefferson told him to do, and that's why Thomas Jefferson told him to do it. So I think I ended up just to being on this bicentennial thing that my chief asked me to, and thinking it would be really fun. Now, I, I got tenure, so thank you. You're, you're welcome, Bob. Now I don't care what that school said before. <laughs> but the stuff I learned and how much interesting it makes history. Now I want you guys, and the reason I have my phone up here, you got some stuff about the doctrine of discovery in the exhibit in that room without you guys probably knowing it. And it's great for going to talk about in a moment. Great big panel in there about things. Okay, I'm getting back to your question. <laughs> Not only do you have to find something first, but if you don't get back within a reasonable length of time and occupy it, then another country can slip in underneath you. England never came back to it. The Spanish built Fort Sitka, they took the Spanish. Russians built Glen Meadows. <laughs> the Spanish built for Sitka had triggers in a quiet. Do you guys know this one? The Russians, like the Spanish yeah, they came as far south as the Mount of Columbia. And they claim they went as far south as uh, San Francisco. And where they went, folks? And they buried these bronze plates. There's one at the Sitka Museum. It's the only one they've ever found, but they numbered them. The one at Fort Sitka is number 12. And the Russians claim they buried up to 30. The French, in 1749, sent a military expedition about a thousand miles through the Ohio Valley, and they were burying lead plates. This land belongs to France because of the discovery of the Marquette and Joliet and those guys. I think farmers still find some of these occasionally in plowing. What a funny thing, going around the world. Well, how funny to put your flag on the moon. You guys know when those moon rocks came back, Richard Nixon, president, he had some of them broken up into tiny little pieces and he put them in the moose cubes and he put them on wooden flats and he gave them to the world leaders. Well, one of them came up for sale on the black market and the United States sued to get it back. So we obviously thought we owned those moon rocks, don't we? We only get a pipeline. Okay, actual rockets, this is exactly what Lewis and Clark were doing. And exactly why Jefferson ordered him to build a fort or to occupy the mouth of the Columbia River. They were carrying out, we long had claimed first discovery of the Columbia River. We'll talk about that in a bit. And now Lewis and Clark are going back for actual occupancy. And then guess what? In 1808, John Jacob Astor writes to President Jefferson a letter saying, Oh, I'm thinking of building a fur trading post on the Pacific. Oh, maybe at the mouth of the Columbia River. I picture Je Jefferson doing cartwheels down the hall at the White House because he writes me back, quote, unquote, I will give you all the support the executive can provide, period, 
So we wanted permanent occupancy of the mouth of the Columbia River because that gave us the clean to the entire drainage system. So I've got to have myself again. But folks, the funny or the Homer Simpson moment in this whole story. Hudson Bay Company was advancing every summer, you know, trading a little further, coming a little further west. And in July of 1811, some of those famous Canadian explorer heroes of the Hudson Bay Company were rowing down the Columbia. And they could hear the ocean. And they're going, we made it! We made it! What is that? <laughs> it was for a story with the American flag. That's the Homer Simpson moment. Astor finished that fort in May of 1811. So, permanent occupancy. And I'm going to get to it in a moment, but this is how we argue that we own the Oregon country instead of England. And this is where Francis Drake's panel in there is relevant. And that's why I have this and the photo I took of it to remind me <laughs> of Iraq. What else? We got to go through this really quickly. But this is what our founding fathers, this is what Thomas Jefferson, this is what our first Congress called this topic, preemption. Preemption just means, you know, you sit in that chair, I can't use that chair. I parked in that best spot up there because I was here before all of you. That preempted you from using that spot, right? So what did they mean here? Why did the first European country that arrives is the only one that can buy your land? You come later, you can't buy your land. You come later, you can't buy your land. I had the right of preemption. And this, Jefferson used this phrase a lot. And that act that I mentioned earlier, that our first Congress enacted about Indians in July of 1790, uses the same identical word. Our founding fathers understood this idea. They understood this international law. I didn't develop that fully. So let me, I go back to the right to sail on the sea was probably the earliest form of international law. The right to acquire through war was plainly a European international law. But the right to acquire through exploration and that charade was also part of the development of international law. And it's a Catholic priest from 1532 who was an advisor to the King of Spain, a professor and a priest, 1532, he gives this famous speech. He does quite a bit of writing about how Spain acquired title in the new world and if that's legitimate. So this idea, now I lost track of why I brought him up, but Francisco de Vittoria, oh, because he's called the father of international law. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> she reminds me. <laughs> so, okay, I have So where are we? So some cases call this European title, that the European acquired. What were Indians left with? Indian title is what the Supreme Court of the United States said. Well, let me tell you, you don't know anything about Indian land today, folks. This tribe that fulfilled the other eight federally recognized tribes in Oregon, the other 565 federally recognized tribes in the United States, when we own land, we don't own the full fee simple title. Because the United States is the legal owner of Indian trust lands. When you hear the word Indian trust land, so a tribe can go out and buy land in fee simple if they want, and the feds have nothing to do with that. But reservation land, land underneath this casino, by law, have to be in trust. The United States is the legal owner. The tribe is what's called the beneficial The United States has the final word of whether a tribe sells it, leases it, or develops it. So this idea of Johnson v. McIntosh is still part of American Indian law today. It's not just a funny old crazy idea that those wacky nuts had back in the 1400s. It's no law. Okay, what else? Well, we already mentioned that Johnson v. McIntosh said this. Tribes now have limited sovereign powers, limited commercial rights. Oh, but here's what I really want to get to. Here's why Jefferson ordered the Wilson Party to the mouth. Finding the headwaters of a river was not the important factor. It was finding the map. The map. I'm going to go back to the map. I like it. Sing a little song. Yeah, do something. Anybody, uh, what about the shape of that Louisiana territory? Anybody? What about that shape of the Oregon country? It's the western drainage system of the Mississippi, isn't it? What's the Oregon country? The drainage system of the Columbia, and we all know how far into Kansas it goes. Well, this is why we almost went to war with England in the 1840s. 
What was James K. Pope's campaign slogan? Thank you, all the younger audiences. No one knows it. They go, who's James K. Pope? I go, well, you heard Obama? Well, there's about 30 before that. No, they haven't heard of Obama now either. Okay. Look at this. What is it? So here's the 49th degree of parallel, folks, where our border is today in England. But James K. Pope runs for office with a slogan that every American knew. You don't run for office with a slogan no one understands. <laughs> a computer in your pocket. No, I didn't check that. <laughs> the, the 54th degree of parallel is up here at the bottom of modern day Alaska. We were claiming all of British Columbia because it was the dream city of the Columbia. The, the Louisiana Territory is the western drain system of the Mississippi. Mary Weather Lewis was ordered to find these borders. And if you read a pretty moving part of his journal, he finally comes to the headwaters of the Missouri. And he says, I am now standing astride that mighty river. How unbelievable. Now, you guys know Lewis and Clark are not the only expeditions sent west. President Jefferson sent Dunbar and Scott up the Arkansas to see, or no, no, sorry, up the Red River to see how far it went. A general based in St. Louis, James Wilkinson, he sent Debulin Pike, Lieutenant Debulin Pike, along the Arkansas. Oh, talk about another coincidence. He finds a mountain out there called Pike's Peak. <laughs> <laughs> And then also, Pike was sent up the Mississippi. And boy, were we stunned and unhappy that it ended right there. You know, that mighty river you would thought would. Okay, contiguity. This is what I call the element. Under this international law, when your explorer hit the mouth. So do you know that after Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase and after the Senate ratified the treaty, he spent the summer of 1804 home writing about a 40 page pamphlet? called the Limits and Boundaries of Louisiana. And he was trying to find out when the French arrived here and trying to find out what the borders were. And of course, that was partly why he was too far to see. There's another thing we're taught that's not true, folks. I hate the distribution. What are we taught in school? Lewis and Clark were a scientific mission that was going out to look at the new flora and fauna. You know, they really expected to find dinosaurs. They thought there'd be a mountain of salt. They thought they could portage the Rockies in half a day. That was how Jefferson and Meriwether Lewis planned out the expedition. You know that Meriwether Lewis was Jefferson's private secretary for two years before he went on the expedition. The two of them were living alone in the White House, the unfinished White House at the time. They would spread maps out and explore maps that, of course, had, you know, boom, 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 beautiful maps. Here's St. Louis. Blank, 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 blank. And there's the coast of Oregon. Because we had found the mouth of the Columbia River in 1792. I'm getting ahead of myself, but anyway, we're talking about how all this became part of the United States. So continuity, treaties, the passing of property rights, you and I claiming over her, and then we spell it say M, you know, whatever. Uh, but how do you finally get the land from her? When do you occupy it? Okay, let's get back to my pen so we were to number four classes for continuity. Oh, that's number six. And Felicity, I just wanted to remind you that Elizabeth I was really big on that one. Elizabeth I was already excommunicated. She was a Protestant through her grandfather Henry VIII. Her yeah. father, sorry, Henry VIII. Why would she care about how the Pope was dividing the world up? Because you and I want everyone else in the room to agree we really own her property, don't we? Come on, you guys, get on board with us. We'll wink, wink, recognize your discoveries, too, if you recognize ours. So Elizabeth I was delighted with this. She knew she might not be the first to discover America, etc., but she can sure get people over there first. So who sent it? Roanoke. 1587, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir something Gilbert. 
and she felt to go where no Christian prince has yet been and acquire for me sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title. She knew this emerging international law. She knew those lines the Pope in Spain and Portugal had drawn. She wanted to use this. Her grandfather had done the same when he sent John Cabot forth, the Cabot that explored North America, probably from Newfoundland, as far south as Virginia, maybe a little further south. It's weird. They'd row ashore every couple hundred miles and go, boop, boop, this is ours, we'll be back. <laughs> you guys know when Cook landed in Sydney, the natives were throwing spears at him. No, we don't agree this is yours. Get out of here. Okay. So where was I? I did it. Okay, right? I went back to what Elizabeth the first, how she got on board with this, and why it literally then became international law. Because the countries of Europe all decided it was the best way to divide her house up. Terra nullius, uh, that's Latin for the earth is empty. The land is null and void. Do you know that Australia was placed under this right by England for over a hundred and Australia by a hundred and forty years? In 1992, the Australian Supreme Court said that was a lie. It was a lie then, it's a lie now, and we cannot continue to propagate a lie. Aboriginal peoples have lived in Australia for over a hundred thousand years without any question. And so Australia has been in a sort of revolution of most of its relations Aboriginal peoples, because they gave up this idea that the crown owned it all because it was empty. But the United States Supreme Court has used this phrase a couple times, and it has been used against American Indians too, but not as bad as the American Australia. Ah, conquest. Well, of course that's one of my ten elements because Chief Justice John Marshall used that word so many times in the Johnson v. Macintosh case. And then he last two. Now, you guys have this in your exhibit out there right now, too. Why were the tribal peoples here denigrated? Why were their pre existing rights ignored? Why were they driven off the land? I mean, I hate to say this, but if they were animals, you can read your exhibit, and if you read what President George Washington, General George Washington, wrote in 1783, he did compare him to these animals. I mean, I've got to get a drink of water here in a moment. I don't have that slide, and it, it, it's chilling to read what General Washington advised the Congress in 1783. He said, well, what happens to the animals of the forest as we expand our borders? He said, that way they disappear. And he said, it's the same with the savage. The savage has the rule. And then, he, I think I quote, he says, both be beasts of prey, though they differ in shape. P-R-E-Y. I'm not going to translate that or, or, or interpret it for you. You see George Mann. So you go read that exhibit and you see how the native peoples from right here were treated. All American uh, advancement across the continent was based on this idea that Indians were savages, they had the wrong religion, they had to be turned into Jefferson's Louis Goldman farmers, because living the life they did is not the way humans should live. Okay, my gosh, we have four minutes. <laughs> Do I have permission? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone that wants to leave, the door is right there. <laughs> and I will point this laser pointer at the back here. <laughs> okay, well, how? Ten more minutes? What do you want? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, well, where were we? Well, uh, I went, okay, went back to the map. So, uh, what did Jefferson know about this? I already just pointed out John C. McIntosh is not for 20 years later. It's written by his cousin, John Marshall. He hates John Marshall. <laughs> Jefferson is a Republican. Yesterday we called him a Democrat. John Marshall was then a Federalist. I guess today that's kind of the Republican Party. What did Jefferson know about the doctor of discovery? I may go through this faster than I normally would if I had two hundred talk, but while Jefferson was president, chiefs came to see him in the White House. He told them repeatedly, you own your land. You ever want to sell it, you buy it. And in fact, in treaties that the Jefferson administration signed with tribes, it said right in the treaty, the tribe cannot sell its land to the individual, cannot sell its land to a foreign nation. 
So you see why the case of Jonathan B. McIntosh was no surprise. Jefferson was still alive when John Marshall wrote that 1823 opinion. Jefferson writes nothing about it. I've researched, I cannot find any comment. So I think it's because the opinion was just passe. Of course an individual can't buy the hand from Indians. It's a government, it's a government issue, and it's this preemption doctrine of discovery right. Did England own it, or did England grant it to us in our treaties? Well, England granted it to the U.S. So of course Thomas Grant got the candle running for the one. Buying the land. Uh, let's see, well, we already talked about this. Jefferson wrote that pamphlet I referred to. He only wrote one book, but he did write a 40-page pamphlet about how big the Louisiana territory. In 1808, the free rights of Congress. We have to buy the lands in the West from the... He understood the tribes still own the land. So the idea that the Louisiana Purchase was the greatest real estate deal in history? False! I got at least four things I've showed you were false. You know what else? No. I don't know anything else that's false. Okay. <laughs> what else? So what do I say? Okay, some of this is almost repeat. Now this is interesting. When Mary Weather Lewis left Washington, D.C., in June of 1803, we didn't know about the treaty. It hadn't even arrived from the, uh, France. Lewis and Clark had passports with them that Jefferson had gotten from the French and the English ambassadors. The Spanish ambassadors knew Lewis and Clark were a threat to do not give a passport. Do you guys know that the Spanish sent four military expeditions out to try to intercept Lewis? And they did intercept that dumb, dumb guy, Lieutenant Zebdo and Pike, and they held him in jail for a while before they kicked him in the rear and sent him back. But anyway, so once we made the Louisiana Treaty, Jefferson writes a new letter of instruction to Mary Weather Lewis, who's spending the winter of 0304 in the St. Louis area, waiting for the ice to break so he can go up to Missouri. And here's what he writes in that letter to Mary Weather Lewis. You don't need those passports anymore. We are now the Sovereign of that Louisiana territory. Because we had bought that property and governmental right from Spain and France through the Louisiana Treaty. But look at this, and you still had the right to live there. This is what the United States has to buy from native peoples the right to use and occupy the land. The Louisiana Treaty was not a real estate. Okay, what well, Lewis and Clark, now you guys, they're country bumpkins, right? I didn't think they would know anything. You know, when I started researching, I did not know that Mary Weather Lewis lived two years in the White House with Jefferson. Private secretary, writing the letters, thinking about strategizing things, and now worrying about corrupting the United States, or corrupting the mind, and trying to claim the glory of the country. They each only have like a few years of official schooling, and William Clark can't spell for a crap. <laughs> you guys ever look at the journals? He spells the word mosquito 26 different ways. <laughs> ways. And there was a Shawnee Frenchman with him whose last name was Drew Yard, and he misspelled his name about a thousand times too. So I thought, what could they know about international law and the papal bull? They knew a lot. And like I say, I learned that obviously they were very intelligent. And Lewis had been Jefferson's private secretary. You can read to this day the speeches that they gave to all the tribal leaders they met during three and four day conferences as they crossed the continent there and back. They had been directed by Jefferson. Remember when the, the expedition was about more than four and fauna? Oh my God, you should read Jefferson's secret instructions to them and you'll see what it was really about. First he asked the Congress to fund it. He said, it'll cost about $2,500. <laughs> it cost $38,500. But, uh, you know, government goes right in. But he said, you can spend federal tax dollars on this under the Constitution because of the Commerce Clause. We will send these men out there to find out how we can engage in trade with the Indian nations. So number one, the expedition was about commerce and trade, and it's how Jefferson, a constitutional lawyer, justified using federal dollars for this expedition. And uh, now I'm showing my memory. You're going to have to buy the book to remember two, four, two and three, excuse me, but four. Oh, absolutely. He wanted them to draw a map. He wanted them to send them the specimens of animals. 
I'm truly not joking when I say they expected to find dinosaurs out there. Because they've been finding bones in what is it? Bone Lick, Big Lick, Kentucky. Some of the first mastodon bones found in the United States were found. So, okay. But you can read this speech they gave. Oh my gosh. Children. They always called the Indians children. I wonder what an important leader, important tribal chief or warrior. Did you understand that word? You're called Nick Kid. <laughs> 2,500 word speech they delivered, and you can read it in. You used to know this. Oh, they, you know, before they wrote a letter to a chief in the Missouri area that was not there at the conference, they were writing a letter what they said. And Clark writes later that that was the template for all our conferences with tribal leaders. Children, we are here. Your old fathers, the Spanish and the French, have sailed across that great shiny sea never to return. Do what we advise you, and it will go well with you. If you do not pay attention to us, we will consume you like a fire consuming the grass of the prairie. We will close our hands and crush you. Welcome, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you again? You guys remember the Jefferson Peace Medal they handed out? I don't know how much you know about Lewis and Clark, but they had three different sizes. Cheese number one, we got the big one. Sorry, and you guys can stand I think, and, and it's historians, this is not Bob Miller that called it that. Historians call, historians call it a sovereignty token. And that if the chiefs accepted these sizes, which were military uniforms and big American flags too, so they were handing out those peace medals and these other objects. And the assumption was that they were now accepting Jefferson in the United States. You know, Jefferson is their new great white father, and that the United States is now somehow over there. That's the doctrine of discovery. That's this claim of sovereignty over the indigenous peoples just because you showed up. Now, I find this pretty funny. When they were in what's now North Dakota, north, western North Dakota, they were with the Mandan and Dr. River people. Cook writes in the journals. Why we just went to dinner with the Hidatsa people and we were so happy they had a big old American flag up inside their urban lodge. Do you guys know that the Mandan Hidatsas lived in enormous uh, mud? I said they wouldn't do that. Mud, uh, I don't know, old, old round thing. They didn't even bring their horses and chickens in there. But anyway, he said, ah, they had a flag in there. But it was hanging next to this damn Spanish flag. So this idea of handing out sovereignty tokens was nothing new to each other. So the English and French and Spanish have been doing this forever. Oh, why they build forts? Have you ever been to either of these recreations? The Mandan recreation, uh, you know, I've been there. Uh, and especially there they could have lived comfortably in those Mandan housing that survived mining forts. Instead they were in this drafty wooden fort. They never got frostbite inside the forts. And then out at our place, why didn't they live with the Chinook and the Clatsop people in those hundred foot long cedar lawn houses that the Chinook lived so warm in? Instead, I'm sure you've been to Fort Clatsop, they lived in that little place. Oh, don't forget the doctrine of discovery. Don't forget element two. We must actually occupy those areas. And we need proof. Cook put coins in jars. What better than a fort with a flag over? And when they left the fort, remember they gave it the chief cobbler of the classics up there. And I've already mentioned Lewis the Branding Iron. They don't really mention the brand. I have searched the journals. I could be wrong. They don't mention the branding iron until they cross the Rocky Mountains. Do I need to go back to my map? Remember, at that time, who owned the Oregon country? Was that dispute? Spain claimed it, Russia claimed it, England claimed it, we claimed it. But now that we've made the Louisiana Purchase, the United States was the only sovereign in that area. So they don't mention the branding iron until they cross the Rocky Mountain and the Oregon country. Now they brand things. Ten or twelve times it's mentioned in the new journals. And I've had arguments with some historians because they branded their horses too. I don't know what branding a horse means to you and what you need to do with it, but I think you would brand it with a branding iron that you had in your suitcase, wouldn't you? But some historians have told me that they But I want to show you the most significant thing in my God, if you had a trial even today, I would go into the Oregon Valley. This next thing would be Exhibit 1. This is called the Fort Classic Memorial. 
Lewis and Clark, as they were leaving, they left on March 23, 1806, to return, and they said themselves, to return to the United States. They knew they were outside the United States in this un, uh, in this area that was claimed by four European countries, three in the U.S. They need this written document. They hang it in their room at Fort Clatsop, and they hand it out to the chiefs, and if any white men show up, give this document to them. Well, I'm going to let you read it. I'm going to get it to drink water. What? what? Isn't this the doctrine of the South? Couple of my ten elements in here. Maybe you do too. Do we have to interpret this? No. They tell you why they wrote this document and why they left it inside the fort and in the hands of the chief. We want some civilized person. Now, no one would believe Chief Cowboy that a bunch of guys from the United States had been here. No, no. We wanted one of the naval captains that would show up. Remember, folks, the Americans, the English, the French, they were taking sea otters and furs off the northwest coast long before it was departed and shipping them to China. It was the most lucrative commercial activity in the world at that time. That's exactly why Americans got there in 1792. So they knew that a boat would show up very quickly. And in fact, Jefferson, so smart, he told them to wait there at the mouth and send two or three men home with a copy of these documents and the specimen they found, send a couple of them home by boat, and the rest can come back over. Because, you know, the expedition could have been wiped out at any second, they might have fallen into the Grand Canyon or something, by an expedition, or prairie dog bull or something, anyway. Some civilized person will tell the informed world that this party, and on the back of this document, book, they wrote the names of all 33 people that went with Lewis and Clark. In County Lewis and Clark, there were 33 people. Chicago Ed, the Baby Palm, Clark Slade North, their names were all on this list. We crossed this entire country. We were sent by the government of the U States to explore the interior, to penetrate the same. Look where they were sent to, to the discharge of the ladder into the Antiquity claim we found the mouth of the Columbia River. I don't need to go back to the map, but we now claim that entire uh, river drainage system. Okay, we already covered that. I'm going back now. Hey, here's the one here. Well, an American of Boston, he was not military. And that's one reason the English argued that this should not count, because he had not been a military official representative of the United States. He was just a sea otter uh, tradesman from Boston. But in May of 1792, he sailed about 25 miles up the Columbia Range from Ancient after his boat. He then goes up north, and that's when he runs into, and I'm going to blank on the name, his famous British Admiral. He said, I just found an enormous river down here. So that famous British Admiral, who I'm Sent Lieutenant William Broughton down there. Broughton sails a hundred miles up the Columbia River, about where the Sandy, I don't know how well you guys know the Columbia, I'm from Boston, where the Sandy comes into the Columbia is where Broughton, that's as far as Broughton went. What do you think he did there? Boop, boop. <laughs> I claim this. Do you guys know what Mount Hood is named after? And do you know who named it? Broughton. Hood was a British admiral. And he tried, you know, why do we name these? Places because that's a form of claim. Lewis and Clark named everything they saw and did and named it after their relatives. Do you know Marias River in Montana? Anybody? It actually means Maria's River. <laughs> it was Clark's cousin. So they ran out of names. Probably a couple other things named after Maria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoa, look at that. And what I already mentioned. For 40 years, folks, we argued with England. Now, first off, we got the government of Spain in a treaty of 1819. Spain agreed to hold its claims no farther north than the 42nd degree of parallel. 
And you take a wild guess where the 42nd degree of parallel is. California, Oregon. We then signed a treaty with Russia. John Quincy Adams, he's my man, JQ, I call him. He was the Secretary of State for both. He signs a treaty with Russia. The Russia will make no claims, document, discovery claim below the 54th degree of parallel. Well, that's that southernmost tip of modern day Alaska. So all the it, only England and us now are fighting over this. And we're fighting over that from 42nd degree to 54th. And J.K. Pope runs for office. 54, 44. So the doctor discovery. Now I don't have a slide for this. Why was England coming in? And here's where you have another exhibit out here, and that's why I have to take a picture of <laughs> The English claim that Sir Francis Drake in 1579 sailed at least to the 45th degree of parallel, which I think is one of the main points on the Orient coast. Sailing. 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 Well, Salem is the 45th parallel, isn't it? So I don't know where that is on the coast. Now there's no question that he made it to. San Francisco Harbor. And everywhere Francis Drake went, here comes that little brass plate. This belongs to Queen Elizabeth I, my girlfriend. But anyway, now you guys, so when James Cook was then sent 200 years later to look for the Northwest Passage, where do you think the British Admiralty tells him to go? Go to the 45th degree of latitude and then go north. So they were trying to connect up Francis and Drake's alleged discovery of the Eastern Star uh, in 1579. And you have a reference, there's a panel here about Drake. So the English claimed, oh God, we found it first with Sir Francis Drake and James Cook. We occupied it first with the Hudson Bay Company and John uh, uh, McLaughlin and Fort Vancouver. You guys can't compete with us. And here's what we were arguing. And I have read the letters back and forth between our Secretary of the State and their Minister of whatever they would call it, Foreign Affairs or something. And we were arguing these three points, they were arguing their three points. And it looked like we were heading for war. We signed two treaties, 1818 and 1827, to jointly share the Oregon country. And finally, when Pope comes into office, then the real negotiation starts. You know, of course, it's not in war, and we agree on the 49th degree of peril which was that line already over Minnesota and North Dakota. So we just extended it. So, okay, manifest destiny. I'm gonna skim on 15 minutes over. So this is not how I define manifest destiny. This is how American historians define it. I should have asked you before, what, what does it mean? We're taught about this, but what is it? Well, you know, we're special. <laughs> we're that shiny city on the hill. Didn't some New England minister write that like in the 60s? The idea of American exceptionalism has been around for a long, long time. We're that shiny city on the hill. You guys know when we went into Iraq, we were kind of saying this same stuff. <laughs> if I would be braver, I would have written an editorial about this back in 06, 07. I didn't, I wasn't that brave. Uh, anyway, so we're special. It's our duty to remake the world in our image, and we're doing this under so what I argue in the longest chapter in my book is that the doctrine of discovery became manifest death. This phrase was used for the first time in July 1845 by a New York editorial writer about Texas. We deserve to own Texas. It's ours. God meant us to have it. They should be Christian. They should not be Mexican. They're, it's us. And he then wrote another editorial about the Oregon country, December 27, 1845. Six months later, and his phrase "manifest destiny" was printed in the week on the floor of the House of Representatives. So this idea that those three points has been a part of American thinking, and my argument is that it's really just the doctrine story. So same ten elements: we're better than other people, our religion's better than other people, especially native people. Get out of the way, be gone. You're weak, God. You know, social evolution, whatever you want to call it. Social Darwinism, Indian people are going away. I think, oh, well, this, this is the last one. We fought over this, the race. Now, so remember, it was a race to get out here. I, I left out one slide. Have you ever heard of Alexander McKinley? The first Europeans to cross the continent of North America was Cabeza de Vaca. 
in Mexico in the 1550s. Do you know what cabeza de vaca means? El cow. <laughs> what a nice name. Wow, no, it's that pretty name. Good. The second was not Lewis and Clark. It was Alexander McKinney, a Scotsman, 1792 to 93. And when he gets to Bella Bella Coolo up in what, British Columbia, what does he paint on a rock? <laughs> That's what he does. And I believe that painting might still be there. I, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, President Jefferson and Mary Rose Lewis were frightened to death that Alexander McKinley had made that crossing first. And they were terrified that he had found the Columbia River. But he found, I guess, the McKinley River? <laughs> and I guess that's not part of the drainage system of the Columbia, but we know he didn't find it in the So they were reporting he published his book. Jefferson and Lewis were pulling their hair out reading his book in 1800, how Alexander McKinley had done it, and whether he had preempted it. And they decided, no, they would see what Lewis and Clark were really about. Geopolitical, land claims, the flora and fauna was so far down the list, I can't keep track. But anyway, so I already said how we got rid of Spain and Russia. These are the treaties. Man, my memory is good. Woo! <laughs> Sign treaties with tribes out here. Now let's just talk Oregon. A lot of the early treaties signed with Oregon tribes were never ratified by the Senate. Candy Point, which is like 20 miles east of Astoria, there were 20 treaties signed in 1850, never ratified. The tribes received nothing for their land, and as they were dying from measles, the flu, the smallpox, nobody to deal with it. What did George Washington say? Beasts of prey, and we will get their lands when we want them. That's exactly what Jefferson and Washington said. The Oregon Territory became a territory in 1848, and if you've never heard of it, Congress passed the Oregon Donation Land Act in 1850, and this is when settlers could get 320 acres if they so this preceded the Homestead Act, and it was a lot larger amount of land. You could get half a section, which is 328 acres, and you lived on it. Oh, we hadn't signed any treaties with tribes yet. The tribes still own the land, according to Johnson v. McIntosh and according to international law. But the U.S. said, well, we'll handle that later. <laughs> <laughs> I have suggested to a couple people that they bring a lawsuit against about the 3,000 people in the Willamette Valley who still own land under grants from 1850, that their titles are invalid. <laughs> I'm not going to file that lawsuit. I suggest it to other people who own a bulletproof vest. <laughs> okay, I think this is the last slide. If this is what the, my subject's about, I hope you learned something tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And I appreciate the invitation and you folks being here taking the time out of your